Good afternoon, political scientists. Welcome to a frankly delayed lesson, and I do apologize about that one. Uh, my original intention was to simply film a lesson in B5, as I did last time in October, but the situation changed rather rapidly. So rather than try and bodge something together, I, I took some time and I actually created a PowerPoint. And rather than do like a voiceover thing, because they're really hard to follow, I thought I'd make a video. Um, so um, we're up to Parliament. And um, yeah, uh, it's a brand new topic. Um, so I hope you all had good New Year's. I hope you all had a break and have had time to relax, kind of, uh, with that very weird second week. Um, I don't know, I didn't really get much chance to think about things. And I tried to steer clear of the news. Not done terribly well at that one. Anyway, the point is we've got a new topic and we're going to move on to it now. So you'll have to excuse me. Um, as much as I like YouTube, I am going to commit vast faux pas by uh, doing this whilst not looking at the camera. I do apologize. But here we have it. And I already gave the game away, but th this this was my attempt at doing a, an intro to the new topic. It's um, it's a mint, you see, because it's a tree ball mint. And, um, it's speaking French. Mon Dieu, c'est tout le monde bof. And um, therefore, it's a talking mint, a parler mint, because talking in French is a parler. So, Parliament, yes. Anyway, moving swiftly onwards. Um, you're going to take notes to this is the idea and uh, a bit like we would in class i'll talk you over a powerpoint uh, we'll discuss what's going on that say we'll discuss i'll talk to you about it uh, you will then leave comments in the comments on the uh show my homework don't don't do it on fa uh, facebook don't do it on facebook I, I wouldn't see it don't do it on uh, the youtube video because i've disabled comments um so do it on the show my homework. But anyway, the definition of parliament, in as much as you can easily define it uh, politically, is that it's a body comprising both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It has supreme legislative authority. That is, it can do anything it likes when it comes to passing laws. Nothing can strike down an act of parliament and nothing can change laws that parliament has enacted. That is the point. No one else is allowed to make law, only parliament. It scrutinises the work of government, and indeed, it's from Parliament that government is drawn. It supplies the membership of government, and it has ultimate sovereignty over the entirety of the UK. Each Parliament is its own sovereign and is not bound by the decisions of previous Parliaments, something I think we've discussed already. So a quick history lesson has to be done. Oh no, my face is in the way. Let's remove my face for a bit. It's going to be a voiceover PowerPoint. I do apologize. Um, so removing my face for a moment, uh, a quick history lesson. You can see the dates across the top there. We're going to do a quick timeline. You'll see this is quicker than it looks. Don't worry. Uh, we start our story with the idea of authority. And this comes from um, the de Montfort Parliament, often called the very first parliament. Now, obviously it wasn't the first parliament, it's in 1265. The first parliament was set up by Magna Carta in 1215, uh, and indeed helped draft that document. De Montfort um, was, Simon de Montfort, uh, was a leading nobleman in a civil war against Henry III. Um, and when Henry III was captured, it was Simon de Montfort who called together a parliament to discuss what to do next and to discuss matters of state. Um, he invited other leading nobles, some knights of the realm, and a couple of, uh, also bishops, and a couple of burghers, i.e. mayors of local town areas. These were commoners. And as a consequence, this is often termed the very first parliament because it involves common people. We want to live like common people. We want to do whatever common people can do. We don't want to sleep with common people. Sorry, Pulp. But, um, Pulp reference, sorry. What you have here is the very first parliament. And from that point until around about the 17th century, so the 1600s, um, you've got a gradual assertion. I've got the wrong way around, haven't I? No, I've got the wrong way around. Uh, a gradual assertion of power and authority against the crown. Now, in the middle of all that, there is, of course, the civil war. But surprisingly, that's not what we're going to focus on. We're going to look at the end of the story in 1689, when William III, a brand new king, invited to rule the country in the glorious revolution of 1688 by Parliament, accepted Parliament's Bill of Rights 
and in so doing, accepted that Parliament had superiority over the Crown. This was the establishment of Parliament's sovereignty. This was the point at which uh, Parliament became primary sovereign and the Crown, um, or rather the King, um, became subordinate almost to Parliament. The Crown arguably isn't. After that, we have the extension of the franchise, and I've highlighted here the dates at which that took place. I've highlighted it badly, and I apologise on this uh, on this video, but yeah, we'll do we'll do our best. There are six separate dates at which the franchise was extended. You, we've gone through all these already when we're talking about the franchise. Each extension of the franchise from 1830 through the Great Reform Act, right the way through to 1969, the Representation of the People's Act lowering the age of voting to 18 with universal suffrage, um, allowed the House of Commons being elected to gain more legitimacy than the House of Lords being unelected. This legitimacy, the right to exercise authority, allowed the House of Commons to slowly increase its influence and the House of Lords to slowly lose theirs. So although the House of Lords is often referred to as the upper chamber, it is less powerful and less influential on our process than the House of Commons. That said, it wasn't until 1911 um, when the House of Lords attempted to veto the People's Budget of 1909 that the House of Commons acted to limit their power. Now, hopefully I've got my animations correct. I have. Here they are, the Parliament Acts of 1911 and 1949. We've talked about them before. I've highlighted them here. 1911 established that the House of Lords, as an unelected body, could only delay and not veto legislation passed by the House of Commons, and the delay was set at two years. This was reduced by a further year in 1949 because there was a new Labour government and the then House of Lords agreed that that new Labour government should probably be able to pass legislation within a quick time frame, provided it was in their manifesto, that was the convention. But 1949 said that the House of Lords could delay legislation for one year only. The idea being that if a delay of one year was enough to prevent it being passed, then it probably shouldn't be passed. One key feature of this between 1265 and, well, now, is that we haven't had any significant uprisings or attempts at revolution in this country. Now, as an historian, I get a little itchy saying things like that, but there is an element of truth in it, in that we've never had a serious challenge to the authority of Parliament. And as a consequence, we've never had to codify the Constitution. It's never had to be written down. If you look around the world, most written and codified constitutions come from people and nations who have experienced upheaval and uprisings. The absence of these means that we've never got round to doing it. What we are left with is Parliament, a body, being sovereign. And in 1999, with the House of Lords Act, um, where we removed all bar 92 hereditary peers, more on that later, um, we pretty much made Parliament the sole exerciser of authority and within that the House of Commons is by far the most powerful chamber. In other words, the people's representatives are sovereign and they can do through government pretty much anything they want, more or less. The rights of the people, as we've discussed, are not easily maintained. So where does government come from? What are we talking about? Well, the form of government in this country is what we call parliamentary. That is, parliament is sovereign, parliament gets its say, parliament gets to choose what happens and what does not. They provide scrutiny, they provide the laws, they provide the impetus, they provide the vote. They are the be all and end all of our government in this country. Uh, it is not a presidential government. The leader of the house, the prime minister, the leader of the government, does not get to make decisions on their own. Though, having said that, the 8pm address to the nation from our current Prime Minister, uh, largely copying the homework of Nicola Sturgeon, it has to be said, um, earlier this week, you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise. He tends to personalise things. If you watch his language, he tends to well, basically say that it's all him and he doesn't want to make certain decisions, which is great, but he's the Prime Minister, he kind of has to. The executive that is the prime minister and the cabinet, the ministers, 
which are invited to form the government, are formed from MPs and Lords. They can be drawn from either house. Convention states that the Prime Minister should not be a Lord, and that was set by uh, Douglas Hume in 1963, but that's just convention. There's nothing saying that has to be the case, and previous PMs have indeed been Lords. And members of the Cabinet should theoretically not be able to sit in, um, or should be able to sit in the House of Commons, but we do have Lords in the Cabinet and they do sit in the Visitors Gallery because they're not allowed to sit in the House of Commons. So there's nothing saying you can't have those things and, and the conventions, well as we've seen uh, with Boris Johnson's government, don't tend to hold that high regard these days. But what this does mean is that we have a fused executive and legislative in our legislature in the UK. The legislature and the executive are bound. They are one and the same in many cases. And this means that theoretically, any government requires the support of parliament. That's all of parliament in order to function. If they fail to get that support, there can be a vote of no confidence and then the government must resign. That's how it works. So, um, for example, in the 1970s, after 1974's double elections, the then Labour government did not rule with a majority. They were a minority government. From the beginning of their time in office to 1979, the next general election, they were on a knife edge and they constantly had to gain as much support or as little support as they could from Parliament. Parliament ultimately held the reins of control. Equally, in 2019, under Theresa May, uh, Theresa Human Rights or optional May, my apologies, uh, we also had a situation where the government had to rely on Parliament. And briefly, Parliament took control of proceedings away from the government, that is the Cabinet, and were joined by crossbench support, that is by people on both sides of the House. And that's an interesting point I'll come back to about both sides of the House, because there's more than one opposition party, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, Sorry, I just thought this was important that you got my face rather than just a screen of things that you've already written down. Um, I'll go back then, don't worry. So, going back to this diagram then, uh, or this thing, there we go. Let's talk about the House of Commons. Now, I was talking before about both sides of the House, and right here you see very clearly two sides of the House. There's the Speaker's chair in the middle. This is the viewing gallery up here. This is uh, more viewing gallery and you get all the politicians down at the bottom here. There's the dispatch boxes and where the Prime Minister stands and where the Leader of the Opposition stands. This created uh, form is indicative of the adversarial nature of UK political life and especially the House of Commons. It's set up with the government on one side and the opposition, the loyal opposition, on the other side. They are there to have arguments with one another. You see that in Prime Minister's question time, and you see that when people talk about debates in Parliament. They tend to talk to one another, at one another. They don't tend to be courteous. Uh, they tend to offer forms of politeness and polite address, but mainly it's about having an argument. That's what passes for scrutiny. Now I'm aware I'm talking very quickly. Were this a lesson, there would be a lot more give and take. You guys would be asking a lot more questions. I'm aware of this. So keep that in mind as you're taking notes. So how does the House of Lords get composed? How do we, how do we start that? So let's talk about the composition. Obviously, you know, there's around about 650 MPs. I say around about, there are 650 MPs. Uh, they represent constituencies of roughly equal size. That means no MP can claim to be more powerful than any other MP when it comes to representation and when it comes to their legitimacy in terms of being voted in. Each MP uh, being elected by a similar number of people means that each region has a differing number of MPs, and I've got that down the bottom corner there. You've got England with 533 MPs elected, Scotland with 59, Wales with 40, Northern Ireland with 18, a theoretical maximum. If Sinn Féin win any of the seats, they refuse to sit in the House of Parliament on the grounds that you have to swear an oath of fealty to the Crown, and they don't. Uh, they just don't. Now, the other thing that MPs represent, apart from their constituency members, is a political party. But I put the word usually 
here too. Um, and the reason for that is because there are occasionally independent MPs elected. Uh, the most recent being from 2005 to 2017. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, sorry, 2015 to 2017, doesn't necessarily follow. Independent MPs are reasonably rare. Now, during 2019, there were a sequence of events where many MPs ended up as being independents. And more recently, the ex-leader of the opposition, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, is sitting as an independent MP because he's had the whip from the Labour Party removed. More about whips and removal in a moment. But usually speaking, the system we've created means that people join political parties, as explained by um, Jay Foreman on that video I keep showing you, because political parties have more resources and people know what you stand for. It makes you more electable. It makes you more open to the voters who don't need to know everything about you. They just need to know what party you represent. There are, however, different types of MP within the House of Commons. Uh, first of all, I'm going to focus on front bench MPs. You may have heard this term in the news, and maybe you already know, and I apologize if I'm teaching Granny how to suck eggs. The, the, the trick is you take a hard boiled egg, uh, you put a hole in the top, and then you purse your lips and inhale. Um, but they're invited by the prime minister to join the cabinet, the cabinet being the executive body within parliament, the, the government, if you will. These are ministers and junior ministers. They don't have to turn up to every cabinet meeting. They don't have to be consulted on business within their ministry, but they are front bench MPs. And as a consequence of being made front bench MPs, there is a convention, and it's not a rule, it's just a convention of collective ministerial responsibility. That is, in public, they must not disagree with government cabinet policy. The cabinet speaks with one voice. If they disagree so much that they have to speak out publicly, then theoretically they should resign. Now, uh, the current government, under the tutelage of uh, the guy that left and got a pay increase, um, they decided that convention is just convention. It doesn't mean anything. And, and they're right. Legally, it holds no ground. So many current ministers have been very happy to disagree with policy in public. To it, uh, Gavin Williamson, arguing that school lockdowns were not necessary and being supported, uh, school, school closing and lockdown were not, was not necessary and being supported in this as late as 6 p.m. on Monday. There was a Department of Education meeting in which he said schools would not close and exams would be going ahead. That was two hours before it was announced that exams would not be going ahead and schools were closed. Do you see the problem here? Collective ministerial responsibility means that Gavin Williamson really ought to have resigned before he said those things, assuming the decision had been taken. But he didn't and hasn't. And it's not the first time, it's just the most recent. So obviously I'm going to talk about it. There's also backbench MPs. They're called that because they sit on the benches, which are at the back and are benches. And um, they're everybody else, literally everybody else. And their job is basically to vote on things. That, that's what they dare, they're to do. They're to provide debate, they're to provide questions. They are just, they're, they're like a choir, I guess. Um, Next up are the party whips. Party whips are people employed by the leadership of the party and they are, they, they do two things. On the one hand, they enforce the party leader's will. They keep a file on each of the MPs and because Edmund Burke, yes, it was him, uh, said that MPs had to act on their own conscience and judgment, they're there to stop them doing that and do as they're told instead. But also, they provide a useful way of finding out what your backbench MPs and your party rank and file are actually thinking in Parliament. So the leader of a party can get wind of any potential coups, any potential um, arguments brewing, any potential rebellions, and seek to appease and or threaten those MPs who would go against the leadership's view, or alternatively simply change their view because there are good arguments being made. Does that make sense? So party whips are kind of a two-way thing. They're kind of like a tin cans on string. Um, you can beat them with the tin cans, or the tin cans can provide communication between the two sections. Um, that analogy went far more violently than I anticipated, and I apologize. 
Next is the speaker. The speaker is there and he or her is supposed to be, or she, he or she, he or she is supposed to be an impartial MP. Their job is not to have a political opinion. Rather, their job is to maintain the decorum and maintain the order. Order! 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 I, I don't know what um, the new speaker's order is, um, but it's not as fun as order, which was great fun from Burko. Um, but they, they don't vote. So when it comes to a division, when, when there's a, a point at which a vote is called, the speaker does not vote. Their job is to tally the votes. And of course, they can't be partial. They can't be part of one side or the other and also announce the result. That would be unseemly. And so they, they don't. Um, there's no real rule in place. It's not even a convention. It's kind of tradition. It's what they do. And the tradition is that they're dragged to the chair because no MP wants to lose the ability to uh, represent the people that voted them in for the party that they stood for. So that's why they get dragged to the chair, though these days that's just a ceremony. I think a lot of MPs would quite like to be speaker. The idea is that this uh, MP is experienced. It's someone who's been in the job for a while, and it's someone who holds respect from all sides of the House, from all the different political parties, because they're supposed to be impartial. They have to be respected by a large number of MPs. And if they aren't, they've got to work very hard to get it. So the Speaker of the House is kind of an important role. What do they do? They arrange the business of the House. They, they decide the agenda that's going to be followed at any particular um, juncture and in what order debates happen, how long those debates are held for, how many votes there are, whether or not there is a vote. They recently also get to decide whether or not government policy fits with Erskine May. Uh, Burkow famously in 2019 referred to Erskine May, saying that the government had brought the same bill three times to Parliament and therefore could not expect a third vote on the same bill. There had to be a substantial change to that bill in order for it to qualify for a new debate and a new vote. They also run the debates and make sure no one speaks out of turn and make sure people keep to the time that they've been given and so on and so forth. They also have teeth. They've got disciplinary functions as well. They can suspend members of parliament for infractions of the rules and they can ask people to leave. Um, as they did, for example, if you look up any YouTube video, seriously, just pick one at random. I would have done it in the lesson. You know I would have done so at this point. Pause the video, go find a, a, a YouTube video on Dennis Skinner. Uh, type in Dodgy Dave, Dennis Skinner, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Exactly what I mean. It's a beautiful video. I, I haven't yet found a reliable way of putting YouTube videos on my own YouTube video. So go look it up on YouTube, uh, pause the video at this point, and uh, I'll, I'll be here when you get back. I think that's long enough for people to have paused the video and then come back. My apologies for the, the break in the commentary. The next type of MP will be the leader of the official opposition. Now note, there's more than one opposition. There's more than one political party standing in opposition to the current government of the day. Generally speaking, however, since 1945, at the very least, and probably before then, uh, we've only had one major party, and we still do. There's no real assumption that the Green Party with a single MP, or, or even the SNP with 48, can really challenge the government of the day because there's a bigger opposition party on the block. In this case, it's Labour. So the two big parties since 1945, at least, have been Labour and Conservative. So the leader of the official opposition, at least as long as we care about, uh, has been Labour or Conservative. And they ensure that government policy is scrutinised. That's their job. They're not to pick holes just for the sake of picking holes. They're there to basically make sure that everything the government does is looked at, discussed, debated and voted upon to make sure the government doesn't just get carried away. They are our defence, if you will, against an elected dictatorship. And if they can't amend policy or force it to change, they can at least bring things to public attention so that we know for the next election. That's kind of their job. So they're not supposed to just swing behind the government, even in times of emergency. They're supposed to make sure that everything gets debated. If you don't believe me, check out how Ch Churchill's policies were debated during the Second World War. There was debate. There was an opposition, even though there was a government of national unity. 
They're also supposed to create a government in waiting. They're supposed to show what they would have done given the same information. And again, you can go back to Jay Foreman, Politics and Boring, it's the first video, and watch that again, and you'll see exactly the same words I'm using here because he does a remarkably good job. But the point of the opposition is to appear like a government and be ready to take over in the event of a general election. That, that's the point. So they do two things. They scrutinize and they appear like a government in waiting. To allow them to do this, since the 1970s, they've been able to draw on a financial reserve called short money. Now we've talked about this already, and it's for parliamentary business, so they can hold offices, they can have secretaries, and they get access to funds to, well, do research and find out what they need to scrutinize and how they can scrutinize the things they want to scrutinize. Finally, the leader of the opposition, the official opposition, creates a shadow cabinet. And I mentioned earlier that the shadow cabinet is essentially a, a mirror to the actual cabinet. And, and that's it, really. Uh, whoever gets appointed to the actual cabinet, if it's a new position, then the shadow cabinet will also have that position created uh, so that they can question their opposite number. That's, that's just how it goes. So that's the House of Commons, its composition, what it looks like. The House of Lords, what does it look like? Well, its composition is that it's mainly appointed these days. And although we call it the upper chamber, and I mentioned this already, it's not more powerful. If anything, it's less powerful than the House of Commons. It's called the upper chamber because it's a bicameral House of Parliament. That is a bicameral has two houses. It's got a, a house that's appointed and a house that's elected. And because this comes from times when monarchs were in charge and democracy wasn't really a thing to think about. It's obviously a bit of an embarrassing secret or an embarrassing uncle. You had the proper appointed chamber with people bred to rule, and you had the elected chamber of Egypts that were elected by other Egypts. Um, I guess we kind of still do. Now they are separated, and they always have been separated into two sort of bits, the Lord's Temporal and the Lord's Spiritual. Lord's Temporal are people that hold power here on Earth, and they are traditionally, those that were sort of here hereditary. They were bred to rule. They were born to rule. They were in the right class. The Lord's spiritual were all about those who held power for the afterlife. And they're the church, capital C. And in this case, we're talking about the Church of England under the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, ultimately, under the king, I appreciate that, or queen. Uh, because that's how our religion works in this country. And their job was basically to advise those lords temporal on what was required to make sure that people stayed getting into heaven, because ultimately that was an important thing. But sir, you say, most people in the country aren't Christian anymore. And no, most people in the country do identify themselves as Christian. Now, whether or not they are Christian is a story for RS and RE, no, just RS and philosophy, uh, possibly global belief in sociology, come to think of it. But generally speaking, I think we can say people identify themselves as Christian. As a consequence, there is a constitutional reason to have bishops in the House of Lords. They are there to make sure the moral dimension is correctly adhered to and that people don't lose out on paradise because they've done something particularly venal or corrupt in life because the government said it was okay. So that's why we have Lords Temporal and Lords Spiritual. But you'll note there's a missing part of that. I said most of them were appointed. Lords Temporal were there because they were hereditary. No one appointed them. And Lords Spiritual were bishops. I mean, I guess they were appointed, but that's not what we mean when I say an appointed member, is it? And you kind of know that. Uh, there's only 26 of them, by the way. Uh, spiritual, I mean. So um, we have to talk about that. There's been a slow loss of influence for the House of Lords. When Disraeli was ennobled uh, by the Queen Victoria, he said, uh, ah, but I am dead, dead, but in Elysian fields. Because politically, it meant that there wasn't much you could do in the House of Lords. And that's before the uh, Parliament Acts of 1911 and 1949. This is in the late 1800s. So you get the idea that even by the late 1800s, the House of Lords was considered an ornamentation. It was considered a largely powerless body with the House of Commons, where the real business of government was taking place. Elysium feels a reference to the afterlife, in case you're wondering. Um, in 1958, this was further hammered home in the Life Peerages Act. This gave the Prime Minister the power to nominate life peers. 
then nominated to the crown. The crown then appoints them on the advice of the prime minister, and they are appointed as life peers. That is, they're there for life and then they die. Um, that's it doesn't pass on to anyone else. They can retire after the House of Lords Act of 2014, um, but generally speaking, they're there for life. Um, those appointments were based on service to the nation. There had to be a reason why they were ennobled. It couldn't just be, oh, they were made. Um, you had to have a legitimate excuse, I guess. More on that in a moment. And this gave the House a different air. After 1958, the House of Lords ceased to be the Elysian Fields where dead politicians went to the afterlife and became more of a professional legitimacy. People began to see it more as a house of experts, of people who knew what they were talking about in their field, and as a consequence, could discuss and criticise and debate government policy from a different perspective, rather than simply the elected representatives of the people. The 1999 House of Lords Reform Act, Tonti Blair was behind this. Um, sorry, I, I can't let the joke go. I really can't, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why, uh, Twitter, pointless letters. Um, go to pointless letters on Twitter, type in the search term Tonti Blair. You, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, Tonti Blair removed 750 hereditary peers from the House of Lords, thereby significantly reducing it in size from around about 1,400 peers to around about 700 peers, 780 odd peers, somewhere around there. In order to avoid the rebellion and confrontation where the House of Lords would seek to stop him and all 750 hereditary peers would turn up and vote against him and therefore he'd lose, he basically reached a compromise position. He said that the 750 uh, hereditary peers could elect 92 of their number to serve in the House of Lords, thereby making them elected members of an appointed chamber, giving them some sort of fig leaf, if you will, of legitimacy, because they've been elected, that they're, they're semi-democratic. And the idea was therefore that hereditary peers that wanted to represent and could represent, rather than those that were a bit old and doddery and just a bit useless, would be in the house. And that would gain them some legitimacy. Since then, there's been no further changes on that one, apart from the 2014 House of Lords Act allowing people to resign. Life peers are appointed by the Crown on the advice of the PM. The PM gets his advice from the Downing Street Main Honours Committee, uh, and they basically submit a list of names, and the PM chooses from that list who goes through on their list. They can add to it, they can amend it, but generally speaking, prime ministers tend to leave it to the committee uh, that is appointed by them to choose who gets to be ennobled. Uh, I have a bit of skin in the game here. My dad was um, preferred to the Downing Street Main Honours Committee and was not ennobled in the end, but could have been for services to local government. And now you know. In 2019, uh, and I couldn't find figures for 2020, for 2019, there were 665 life peers. And in 2019 as well, there have been 782 active peers, that is, lords that turned up to the House of Lords. I assume there are more, but these are the people that bother turning up and voting regularly. Hereditary peers then, there are 92 of them. They're elected. That's been the same since 1999, it won't change. Um, the moment someone dies, they're replaced by someone else because it, it's hereditary, it's passed on by birth. And you can elect a new one if one of the ones that have been elected have died. Bishops from the Church of England, and it has to be from the Church of England, that is our uh, state church, our state religion. And, and there is such a thing, remember, that the monarch is head of the Church of England. They are their own pope. You learn about this in year seven when we did about uh, Henry the Fat Eighth. Um, there are 26 such bishops and they still turn up and they still vote. So that takes us to, I don't know, around about 691? Yeah, about that. 691 um, people in the House of Commons, uh, House of Commons, House of Lords. Um, the remainder are, well, I, I don't know. I don't know really. Oh, they're the hereditary peers, you add them up. Sorry, I, I'm an idiot, I can't add them. Um, now the textbook says that this means that the House is less political. And as evidence, it suggests that there are a bunch of crossbench peers, and they're not wrong. Um, the convention is that any prime minister appointing life peers should do so based on the composition of the House of Commons when it comes to political affiliation. So if they're um, producing 
now say an honours list under Boris Alexander de Feffel Johnson, uh, then theoretically speaking, there should be a larger group of conservatives, but there should be a fairly sizable minority of Labour supporters being ennobled and sent to the House of Lords. That, that's the convention. But note the word convention. There's no rule here. It's just an assumption that that's how it's done. Since 2016, it's been less so. So let's, let's have a look at the figures and I'll, I'll make the point. Crossbenchers are lords that are ennobled, that are sent to the House of Lords, that have no political affiliation. They're there simply for their expertise. They're there because of the services of the nation and they refuse to pick sides. They tend to sit in the middle. Uh, these hassocks in the middle here are the crossbenchers where you're neither one party nor the other. They're called hassocks. Um, so they have no political party, no political affiliation, and there are 180 of them as of this year. I couldn't find total figures for the number of lords, but I could find the number of crossbenchers in 2020, I say this year, last year. Uh, there have been 186 crossbenchers in 2018. Now contrast that with 249 conservative peers in 2018, and currently 257 as of December 2020 implying there's a small but nevertheless significant uh, switch from crossbench, those who hold no political affiliation, to, well, holding more of a political affiliation. There's a baked in conservative majority because the conservatives were in power for so very long and therefore were able to appoint more peers than the Labour governments that followed under Tonti Blair. And indeed, since David Cameroon uh, in 2015, there've been way more conservative peers appointed, so that baked in majority looks like it's going to continue. Who runs it? It's the Lord Speaker. In much the same way as the Speaker in the House of Commons, this is an impartial person in the House of Lords who's there basically just to maintain order, decorum, uh, and ensure politeness, organise uh, debates, organise time for those debates, organise the votes and make sure that no one needs uh, disciplining. And if they do, they are disciplined appropriately. You'll also notice that although it's set up in a similar way, there's no table in the middle. Debate can come from any direction. No one comes and approaches the middle and yells at the other side. And as a consequence, debates tend to be more courteous. They tend to be more expertise based than they are party political. There is something to that. And I don't know, over time that may well make people like the House of Lords more. It's all a bit weird, but yeah, they do debate things and they do pay compliments to their debating opponents quite often. And they will concede points. I know it's an astonishing idea. They will literally concede points mid debate if they are convinced. Something that you don't tend to see in the House of Commons. That said, there is an element of cronyism and it has been creeping in. Um, Nick Clegg said of David Cameron's appointments in 2016 that he wasn't the first prime minister to appoint mostly friends to the House of uh, Lords, but he ought to be the last. Well, he wasn't. Um, there's been a lot more appointees. Theresa Human Rights or Optional May appointed many people, including personal friends, um, to the House of Lords. Um, David Cameron, appointed his wife's hairdresser. Alexander de Feffel Johnson has appointed various people whom he simply likes. And very few Labour peers have got in. Uh, under David Cameron, they tended to be opponents of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, ditto under Theresa Human Rights for Optional May. And these days, there aren't many opponents to Starmer, so it's harder to do, but there hasn't been a new list, so I don't know since Starmer. Uh, but yes, there are definitely, elements of cronyism, that is friends and family and people who you like get appointed to these political positions whereby they basically behave like political animals um, in the House of Lords and ensure that the government line is taken or their party political line is taken. And as we can see, there are fewer crossbench MPs than there used to be. So where does that leave us at the moment. Well, it leaves us with an incredibly long video for which I can only apologise, and it leaves you guys with some notes that have begun to make sense, make sense of what Parliament is in terms of its composition, in terms of what the different roles are. My uh, idea is that by tomorrow I'll have created some lessons on the functions of the House, what it is they do, what jobs do they take, um, 
And I'll try and illustrate that with more up-to-date examples. As time goes on and I get more on top of things, I should be able to make more of this. I'm hoping it's still interesting, even though it's all a bit weird at the moment. So thank you very much, if you have been, for watching all this time. And to those of you that have paused, well, I don't guess I get to say anything to those people because, well, they, 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 they've gone. But thank you, if you have been, for watching. And uh, I shall see you tomorrow with a new video. And again, two lessons worth of material, um, I think, because I may as well, I'm so late today. Um, so I'll try and make up for it tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you another.